Amen. Hey, welcome to church, Church of 1122. That was, uh, that was Rusty Pritchett, one of our elders here at the church. He's big and he's buff. He's buff and he's a crier, you know. So he cries. Some people cry. It's okay. I don't cry. I work out. I have hobbies. But he's a, he's a crier. And uh, I hope when I grow up, I'm half the man that Elder Rusty is. Throughout this series, Rescued from an Ordinary Life, we'll introduce you um, to, to um, all of the elders other than me. Uh, just, just so you can see a picture of what um, an extraordinary life looks like. Each of these men um, have been rescued from an ordinary life. If you've got your Bibles, go Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Um, also, we're at kind of standing room only. If, if you could scoot in a little bit and the people that are standing... Um, on the back there, you guys, we probably have seats, but sometimes people just like to space out for whatever reason, you know, because they're like, uh, you're a dude, I'm a dude, we're not sitting next to each other because I don't know you. So uh, if we could just kind of adjust a little bit, we'd love for, for you to have a seat. I preach for a long time, so we want you to be comfortable, and uh, we'll make that happen, all right? What a great little move that was. Thank you. Also, <clears throat> need to let you guys know that we have a 522 Sunday evening service, 522 Sunday evening service, and so there's a few hundred people that attend that service, so we'd love for you, um, you know, you don't have to come today to 522 because you've already been here, but uh, next Sunday, we'd love for you to try the 522 service to free up seats for our 1122 service. Also, we have a 722 Thursday night service, so try one of those alternative times. We would appreciate it. All right, we are beginning a brand new series called Rescue from an Ordinary Life. There's no real introduction. Let's go Acts 20, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says in Acts 21, after the uproar ceased, if you'll remember two weeks ago or three weeks ago, the uproar was in Ephesus for two hours. All of the city came together and screamed, great is Artemis, great is Artemis. So they're in there screaming and shouting, great is Artemis. And Paul sees a crowd. He likes to preach to crowds. Who doesn't blame him? Wants to preach to crowds. His buddies come in and go, nah, dog, if you go in there, they're going to kill you. So come here with us. And so he waits for that to all settle down. That's where we are in Acts 20. So after the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. And when he had gone through, these re- through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece, and there he spent three months. And when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And Sopater, the Berean son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secondus, who's younger brother to Firstus, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> and, uh, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus, these went ahead, went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. Do you ever read through the Bible and you look at somebody like Paul and think, man, Look at the epic adventures of Paul. I mean, he's going to cool places. Any of you guys ever been to Troas? Me either. I don't even know where it is, you know? Or Greece. Maybe you've been to Greece. I've never been to Greece. And and, and you you look at stuff like this. You see Paul's life, and you think, man, what an amazing life. I mean, look at his friends. Who has friends with names like this? Trophimus. What a great name is Trophimus. You know why all these details are in here, by the way? Because it actually happened. So some guy was reading this a few years later and was like, shut up. You know Trophimus? That's my buddy. We were in T-ball together. But you read about the epic adventures of Paul. I mean, he's going to cool places. He's got, I mean, he's got, his friends have cool names. You know what my friends' names are? Ben. (laughs) Doug. Chad. That's it. I need Trophimus and Secondus. I mean, it's just cool names and cool places. And, and I think there are times where we look at this and the great adventures captured in the scriptures. And then you look at your own life. And you think, man, my life's just kind of just kind of ordinary. I mean, this dude, th- there's a conspiracy against his life. Well, the greatest conspiracy you and I are fighting against most of the time is the HOA, Right? You get a letter from them and think, really? It's really about the recycle bin? That's the great adventure, the great battle that I'm fighting? <laughs> but Paul goes to cool places, does cool things, got cool friends. And so many of us just wake up and think, man, I wish my life was cool. It's just kind of, blah. I mean, I, 
I, I remember when I read the book Wild at Heart. If you hadn't read the book Wild at Heart, you should read it. Wild at Heart by John Eldridge. A couple little theological nuances that need to get tightened up in there. But for the most part, it's a great book. Um, if I ever meet John, I'll tighten him up. Don't worry. But, but the, the essence of the book is awesome. Um, guys, you need to read this book, Wild at Heart. Girls, you need to read this book. All right? It'll help you raise your sons and your husbands. All right? It'll you, you help you know who we are a little bit. It says, deep in every man's soul, God put three things. A beauty to rescue, a battle to fight, and an adventure to live. And you read that book, and you get all caught up in it, and you think, yeah. But then you look at your life, and you're like, man, my adventure consists of, you know, get up in the morning, and an alarm goes off, and, and I have to decide, shall I wake to crickets or xylophone music today? <laughs> then you get up, make huge decisions, like bagel or cereal. And then go to the gym, maybe try to work out a little bit. You don't even have goals in the gym. Your only goal is don't be fat. That's what you're living for. <laughs> try to find workouts that don't really hurt that bad, but somehow still work. And then you go back home and help get the kids to school. And you go through that deal. And then, and then you, you know, you're in carpool line. And, and, and you just, you know, that's a battle, right? Because you, you know you're trying to cheat and get ahead before you get over. And you should have got over back there. But you're trying to cheat the system. And you do that for a little while. And you drop your kid off. And then you go to work. And you're in, and you're in work. You're in meetings all day long to sell something that you don't even care about. I mean, you really don't. You're trying to get people to buy one of these things. And they don't even need it. And by the time your meeting's over, it's already outdated. Because the competition came out with version 11.8. And you're like, oh, and then you get, you get out of work, and you get in your car, and you're just trying to the great adventures to miss JTB traffic at 5 o'clock, and, and you get home, and then you run that suburban parent jingo where you're like, all right, you get her and take her to that, and then I'll get him, and then we'll, and then we'll meet at Chick-fil-A, and you're like, oh, crud, it's Sunday, can't do that, and you <laughs> go that deal, and then you finally get home and have to eat leftovers, and, and then the great thing you're living for is the walking dead in three weeks comes back on. Right. You cheer for dead people on AMC. Then you lay down at night to go to bed and you think, is this it? I mean, is this really it? Is this what I'm living my life for? Just carpool and new pants. That's it? Don't you lay in bed thinking, I didn't really imagine it going this way. I mean, when I was in middle school and somebody said to me, what do you want to be when you grow up? I never stood up proud and said, middle management. <laughs> no. There's something just gnawing going, there's got to be more. And so what I'm going to do in our time together as we walk through this text is, <clears throat> from the time you could think, until today, whether it's been like 10 years or 85 years, this, our culture has spent billions and billions and billions of dollars to help, help you buy into what is essentially a lie. They want you to get on the merry-go-round of normality and just do laps for the rest of your life until your quarter runs out and it's over. And they want you to just buy into just an ordinary life. And some of you, because you were created for more than that, deep inside, you've got this gnawing that there must be more. There's got to be more to life than just wake up and eat toast and work and then die. There's got to be more to that. There's got to be more than just go to school and make good grades. Why? So you can get into high school. Why? So you can get into a good college. Why? So you can get a degree. Why? So you can get a job that's not in your major. Why? So that you can make a bunch of money. Why? So you can buy a bunch of stuff to impress people that you don't even like so that you can die one day they can sell it all in a garage sale. Really? That's it? And just round and round and round you go on the merry-go-round of normality. Do you guys remember the age when you realized the merry-go-round was lame? I mean, at one point when you were little, it was awesome. And you were like, man, I can't wait to get back to the merry-go-round. I mean, if there's a horse, or you can ride a dragon or a goat or, or you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're like a lame kid, you're riding the one that doesn't even move. But if you're adventurous, you get on that one. But then you get that age, I don't know, seven, eight years old, and you get on the merry-go-round and you're like, this is, this is lame. I mean, I got no control. We can't go anywhere. I've got to follow this chick in front of me. It doesn't go up that high. It just kind of round. The highlight of the thing is waving at mom on the way around. There she is. Oh, there she is again. Same picture, mom. Okay, I'm over it. But at least then you get to go on to roller coasters. You know, you get to graduate to something. 
And if you're in middle school and you're in high school, life kind of seems adventurous because you graduate every little bit. I mean, everything you do, you get a trophy, and then you go to school. If you're in fifth grade, you get ready. I'm going to middle school. And then from middle school, you graduate to high school, and high school to college, and then college to your first job, and you get married, get your first house. But when you're, you know, for a lot of us in this room, there's not a lot of graduating coming anymore, and then you're just looking around going, what's next? Oh, I guess this is it. This is it, really? For the rest of my days, I just go round and around and around in this circle that I'm excited about The Voice on TV, really? You're a grown person watching karaoke and it's the highlight of your week? <laughs> Do you know that you were created for so much more than that? That you were created to live an abundant life and, and that we should not settle for ordinary. The, the book of Ecclesiastes says that God has set eternity in your hearts. That's why you're not satisfied. Because this world, even if you grab everything this world has to offer, it just can't satisfy. And that gnawing in you that there, there must be more, what I want to do is plead with you and beg the Holy Spirit to move in your world so that you can live the life that Christ has called you to live, that you can get off the merry-go-round of normality, because it ain't even that merry. And that you can step in to live, to live this life of audacious faith in God. To do whatever it is that he has called you to do. So what a lot of people do is when they, you know, they achieve all kind of stuff in this world. Financial success, relational success, whatever. They achieve all kind of great things. And then they get that gnawing and they think, well, there's must, there must be more. So maybe, maybe I need to address the spiritual side of my life. And so they go to church. Which is good. You ought to go to church. They go to church and then what oftentimes happens is these great dreams and visions that they once have actually just... The church can become just a graveyard of dreams and visions. And that you look around the church and it's the same merry-go-round that just has a cross on it instead of whatever else the world has to offer. Look at verse 7. Look what happens in this church service. Verse 7, on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked to them. So they're going to church and it says Paul talked with them, but really he was a preacher, he talked to them. He talked with them like we're talking together, all right? I'm doing all the talking, you're going to do all the listening. Occasional amen would be awesome. <clears throat> there you go. So on the first day of the week when they gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. All right, so let's not talk about long sermons anymore, okay? He started at, I guess, dinner time, and he takes it all the way to midnight. Now, here's the thing. The average sermon in America is 36 minutes long. I am not average, okay? I got more to say than you can get done in 36 minutes. Verse 8, there were many lamps in the upper room where they had gathered, and a young man named Eutychus sitting at the window sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. So if you fall asleep in church, it's kind of biblical, all right? <laughs> but it doesn't end well for the sleeper. Look what happens to this cat. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Now listen, I've preached some stinkers in my life. <laughs> but I don't think I've ever bored anybody to death. So Paul keeps preaching on and on and on. And Eutychus, a young man, sitting in the windowsill, he gets so tired, he just gets lulled to sleep. Falls asleep, falls out of the window, apparently cracks his head on the floor down on the on the floor level and they he's dead don't you hate it when you're trying to stay awake and I know students you guys have been up you know you've been at, at retreat all weekend and you probably got four hours of sleep combined from Friday until right now so if don't sit near the window but luckily here at Walmart we only got one floor so worst case you might fall out your chair and bump your head you probably won't die but if you go sleep in church you at least, let me just tell you how to do it, okay? Get your hands together like this and lean on the chair ahead of you. <laughs> just act like you're praying. That's what I did in high school. I'd lay down like this, and when the teacher would be like, wake up, I'd go, again, dear God, I pray for my teacher. Amen. What was that? <laughs> Spending time with the Lord. But if you want to do calculus, that's great. So, and again, if you slip out of your chair, somebody will get you. <clears throat> now, he, here's the thing, though, that I think happens so often. I mean, when you think about church in general, maybe not ours necessarily, ours might be a little bit different, I hope, but when you think about church in general, do you think, man, that's a place where dreams happen, that's a place where visions come alive, that's a place of excitement and audacious faith, 
But isn't one of the primary things that people would describe church as, and one of the reasons they don't go to church is because it's boring? Do you know how sinful it is that pastors and leaders of churches would create a kind of environment that would end up being a graveyard for visions and dreams? Because you know what I know? I know that at some point in your life, God placed a dream in you, a vision in you, and you actually believed that God had a purpose and a plan for your life, and it was not to harm you, but it was to prosper you and to give you a hope and a future. And you actually believed that God was going to move and God was going to do. But the problem is, not only maybe you got hop on the merry-go-round of ordinary, but maybe you went to church and it just kind of lulled you to sleep too. And you just, you know, kept doing programs after programs after programs. And this great vision, this great dream that you had at one point in your li life, it, you just kind of fell asleep and fell out of the window. And now you can't even find it anymore because it's dead. That is not the kind of church we want to be at the church of 1122. What we're trying to do at this church, me as the lead pastor, I believe that one of my primary jobs is to be the lead servant. That my job is not to just cast vision and say, I need you to get on board with my vision. I believe God has a vision for my life and a vision for this church, and I will proclaim it proudly. But my job is to cultivate the kind of environment, along with the rest of our staff, the elders, the deacons of this church, is to cultivate the kind of environment in this place where you hear from the Holy Spirit. To know that God has a dream and a vision for you and that this would be the kind of place, I mean, it'd be like a dream center. It would be the kind of place where visions would, would come alive and dreams would happen and that it wouldn't be the church of no, but when you came forward and said, I believe God is calling me to do this, that we would cultivate a kind of environment here where those things would grow and flourish and one day when you're telling your story and people said, how in the world was God able to accomplish so much through you that you would actually say, well, you know what, the church that I that I went to that was the that was like the garden where this idea and this dream and this vision where it grew up and it blossomed and that God would just line all of us that have similar visions up and those those of us that that believe that God has called us to be a disciple making disciple kind of church and take the gospel to the nations and serve the poor and and set the captives free that God would just line all of us up together and that would be the family known as the church of 1122 amen that's the kind of church we want to be now, look what Paul does. Paul doesn't let a sleeping dead guy stop him. I love it. Verse 10. It says, But Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in his arms, says, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. I mean, think about what Paul's thinking. You know, he's walking down steps, and he's going, Dang, my bad. I killed a guy I was preaching so long. And he gets down there, and he scoops the Eutychus up, and he goes, Nah, he's still got a little life in him. All right, he's still alive. In verse 11, And when Paul had gone up and broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a little while, or a long while. The Paul just called a timeout, resurrected the dead guy, got a snack, and went back to preaching. <laughs> Paul's like, hey, Eutychus, I'm sorry you're dead, but come on, don't be dead anymore. And uh, I still got two points left in my sermon, so everybody, let's go. And he preaches a long while until daybreak. Until daybreak. We'll be out by one. And so departed. And then look at verse 12. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. Now, sometimes the Bible has some weird ways of saying they were comforted alive. Okay? So they were alive and then Yoda helped write the second part and not a little comforted. <laughs> here's, here's what I want you to hear. Um, if you're a Christian, and I don't mean if you just go to church. If Jesus is your Lord... If you have surrendered your life to the Lordship of Christ, because of verses like Matthew chapter 28 at the end where, where Jesus says, therefore, go to the ends of the earth and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and lo, I will be with you always, even to the ends of the age. And because of verses like Christ commands in Acts 1-8, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Because of commands like that, if Jesus is your Lord, and you're, you don't have a right to be bored. Do you understand that? If you think that you just live in an ordinary life, and you call yourself a Christian, then let me remind you of the great commission. And, 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 and this, this life isn't just about getting up in the morning and going to work and selling some widgets and then coming home. And, and it's not about those things. 
that you've actually been created for more than just this world. And, and maybe the reason that your dream has died, it very well could be because you've had the wrong dream. Maybe your dream was either too small or you were just dreaming about the wrong stuff. C.S. Lewis says it this way. I wish I was smart enough to say stuff like this, but I can't think of it, so I have to quote guys like him. Listen to what he says. He says, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Let me read it again. I mean, just please let this sink in on you. If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, then the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. So if your dreams and visions have, about, have been about what you could accomplish in this world, and yet some of you accomplish those things and you know that they don't satisfy, then I think it's, an, it's evidence that your citizenship is not of this world, that you were actually created for another world, created for eternity. And so that, that merry-go-round of normality is just all about the temporary and I hope and I pray that at an early age, at an early age, that you'll find out that, hey, listen, I, I want to step off of that merry-go-round and step into this, this faith adventure that Christ has called me to. And that's what we're talking about in Rescued from an Ordinary Life. You see, here's my hope. Our hope is that every man, woman, student, and child that calls COE22 home would walk away each week like Eutychus did with he, he says he walked away alive and not a little comforted. That you would walk out of this place every single time you encountered Jesus in this place. And you would walk away alive. I mean, those dreams and those visions that have, have fallen asleep and died in you that God placed a long time ago, that they would be resurrected like this kid was resurrected, and that you would walk out of here alive and not a little comforted. You would get great comfort from the Holy Spirit. Now, you might be a little afraid. You might be a little nervous. You might be a little, oh, no, what is my next step? You might be a little, I can't, I don't know what my friends are going to say as I begin to live with just audacious faith in what God could do. But I want this to be the kind of place where our people hear from the Lord and then do something about it. See, the Bible says this in Psalm 37, 4. It says, delight yourself in the, in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Desi delight yourself in the Lord. That's why we talk about abiding in Christ, that you would be delighted in God. And then, as you make his name glorified, that your joy would also be complete in him. You see, it gets twisted sometimes. Instead of delight yourself with the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart, a lot of people hear it this way. Delight the Lord and he'll give you what you want. That is not what it says. But I want this to be a kind of place where every time you walk out of here, that you walk out alive and not a little comforted. You see, because here's, here's the truth. <clears throat> Unless Jesus comes back today or soon, every one of us one day are going to die. I don't know if you've kept up with this, but the death rate in America hovers right around 100%, all right? <clears throat> and so, th there will come a day when I'll, I'll die, and, and they're going to, you know, dig a hole, put me in a box, paint me up, people are going to have a viewing, it's kind of a weird deal, right? The day before, everybody's going to come to the funeral home and look at me and be like, yep, there he is. And then walk away and say, he looks so good, don't he? No, you don't. You're dead. You look terrible. <clears throat> and, uh, and then they'll have the funeral, close the box, put you down in a hole, cover you up with dirt, come back to the church and eat potato salad and talk about how great you were. And if you get a tombstone, there's going to be a few things on your tombstone. They're going to put your name, and they're going to put the year you were born, and they're going to put the year you died, the date you died, and there's going to be some kind of little thing about you, some little phrase, good, something. And it'll be awesome. And the most important thing you'll have on your tombstone is that little dash between those two numbers. That's it. That little dash represents your entire life. And right now, you're sitting in that dash. You're sitting in somewhere between that first number and that second number. And I just ask you this. So on that day, how do you want people to describe your dash? What do you want people to say about you? Because I don't want people to say, you know what, he was ordinary. He was normal. 
he got up, decided between bagel and cereal, did carpool, you know, worked for some stuff, and then on and on, watched sitcoms, and then died. I don't, oh my goodness, no. I want to be the kind of person that is alive and that is living in that audacious kind of faith, that is rescued from the ordinary life, and that is walking in that extraordinary adventure that Christ has called us to. And so, in fact, um, <clears throat> I took it so seriously that that when, when the guy that led me to Jesus, when they were doing his funeral, they read Acts 11.24 about Coach Bully, the guy that led me to the Lord, and he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people brought to the Lord, and I put it on me so that every day I could have a reminder of how I want to live my life, what I want to do with that dash of my life, and I want to be a good man. I mean, redeemed by the blood of the cross, I want to be a, a, someone that's faithful to Christ, but I want to be a good husband and a good dad. And if I'm a good preacher, that will be secondary even to the fact that I was called to love my wife like Christ loved the church. Jesus said he would build his church, and I'm going to love her. And I want to be a good dad. That's why I coach Little League, because I want my son to know, like on Thursday night for our 722 service, I mean, I'm rushing right from Little League practice to here to preach, kind of sweaty and, and, you know, coming straight out of Little League. Nothing prepares your heart to be with the Lord more than trying to train up seven-year-olds to just quit hitting each other, okay? But I, I want to be a good dad. I want to be a good friend. I want to be a good man full of the Holy Spirit. I want people to know, I want you to know, I really love Jesus. And when people talk about me, I want them to know he, he really knew him. He really knew Jesus. He heard from the Lord that, the, that, that God deposited the Holy Spirit in his life and, the, and God had an easy time just manipulating the reins of Joby Martin's life. And that I would know the shepherd and I would know his voice and I want to be a man that's full of faith. The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is fear and I will not be ruled by fear. But I want to walk in faith. There ought to be something in my life always that if God doesn't come through in a major way, I'm in big trouble. Because God has called me to step out in faith and follow him. And I want, on that day when they put me in the ground, that there would be lots of people there. Not because I was popular, but because a great number of people have been brought to the Lord. And a great number doesn't mean large crowds. Praise God that there's lots of people that show up here to hear the gospel every week. But that great number would just be one person. That just one more, I'm praying that on the day they bury me, that because of the testimony of my life, the gospel would penetrate hearts, and at least one more on the day I'd get buried, that that person would enter the kingdom of heaven too. So what about you? What, what are you going to do with your dash? Just another lap on, on the merry-go-round of normality? You see, don't waste your life. I was listening to a John Piper sermon, he's one of my favorite preachers, and uh <clears throat> The sermon is probably 10 years old, and he was talking to a bunch of college students, and he was talking about the great American tragedy. And he said, the great American tragedy pulled out this article from Reader's Digest. I know it's a big hit with our uh, student crowd, a lot of Reader's Digest fans here. And he, and he read about these, this couple in their early 50s that retired and moved to Florida. And they, they went to church, they were semi-active in their church, but it just talked about what they were going to do with the last chapter of their life. And God had blessed them financially, so they were able to retire in their 50s and buy a house in Florida. And they moved down here to do some sailing and to collect seashells. That's what they were going to do with this gift that God had given them. This, this time in retirement. And again, they called themselves Christians, and I'm not doubting that they were. But John Piper says, can you imagine the day when they stood before the creator of the, of the universe, their Lord and their King, Jesus and Jesus said, what did you do with that gift of that dash that I gave you? I blessed you so much early on with success that you could have used that for significance in your final days. And what did you do? And this couple would have said, here's our seashells. Now listen, if you collect seashells, oh boy. <laughs> I mean, that's cool, collect you some seashells. But if that defines your life, you've got to be kidding me. I, see, I don't, want, I don't want that to define my life, not that kind of thing. Um, I, I, here's a couple of questions um, that, have, that have helped me 
help people navigate what they're going to do with their life. One of them is this. You should ask yourself this question. If you could do anything, anything in this world, if you could do anything and you knew it wouldn't fail, what would you do? I mean, if you could do anything and you know God's going to provide the resources, the people, the whatever, if you could do anything in this world and you knew it wouldn't fail, what would you do? And if you answer with something stupid like, I'd buy a lotto ticket, then you're dreaming too small. You're dreaming about the wrong things. What would you do? See, to quote John Eldridge from that same book, Wild at Heart, he says, and I use this a lot, especially when I'm, I'm discipling some young guys, figuring out what they're going to do with the rest of their life. And students, you take us wake back up. Listen, this is for you. I know, I know. Hey, welcome back. So, <laughs> it's good. And Jesus moved on retreat. He's about to move in you right now. Listen, <clears throat> when you're trying to figure out what to do with the rest of your life, don't ask what this world needs. Ask what makes me come alive. Because what this world needs is for you to come alive. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> And it's not just more trinkets of this world. So let me tell you, if I could do anything in the world and I knew it wouldn't fail, you know what I'd do? I'd plant the church of 1122. That's what I'd do. And, and it's easy to say this this year, right, after it's kind of going really well. But I'm just telling you, uh, a year and a half ago when we had no idea if it was going to work or not, I just thought if, if, if I could do anything, what would I do? That, that I'd, I'd, with the people that I love so much, our team, our staff here, I just want to do life with that crew and make disciples right here in Jacksonville for the rest of my days. And you know what makes me come alive? This right here. To teach the Bible that I love with the people that I love. Man, I love the church of 1122. The people. You. I love. I can't describe to you. So like, you know, when you come up and we're eating dinner and you're like, I'm so sorry to bother you. I'm like, would you hush? Come on. If you're, if you're an 1122-er, I just can't wait to meet you. And to preach about this Jesus that I love so much, it makes me come alive. You know what I did on Wednesday from like 11 o'clock in the morning until about 5.30 in the afternoon? I just walked through the rest of the book of Acts, and I mapped out the sermon series and the titles and the, and the bottom lines from here all the way to Easter. And I mean, I was geeked out in my office, just alive. And I know some of you are like, that sounds like punishment to me. I'm just, I'm just telling you. And then, you know, Pastor Ryan will come in. I'll be like, listen to this, bro. And we walk through it. And he gets all geeked out too. And I'm just saying, it makes me come alive. And so what I want you to do is I want you to be free to, to pursue what Christ has called you to pursue. And some of you at some point were given a dream. And you let that thing fall asleep. And this church is going to be the kind of place that resurrects those dreams, that resurrects those visions. That, that cheers you on to just be obedient to what Christ has called you to do. Now listen, don't hear this. Don't hear, are you saying that I'm supposed to quit my job and go to work at church? Is that the only way to be significant? Oh, absolutely not. That would be, a, that, that would be atrocious. All right? Some of you, there's like 1% of the people that will be here this weekend that need a change in context. Some of you need to change venue. There's some of you moms that Christ has called you to go home and you need to go home. There's some of you moms at home and your kids are saying, please go to work. And they might be right, all right? So <laughs> there's some of you and you've, you've, just, you've just sold out to the merry-go-round and you need to get off of it. But the majority of you in the room just need to change a perspective. That you need to love Jesus and still lead your company or love Jesus and still sell whatever you're selling or love Jesus and be a doctor or love Jesus and be that police officer or love Jesus and do whatever it is he's called you to do. He hasn't called all of us to work here, but you need to love Jesus and then understand that you are the light of the world and that nobody lights a lamp and then puts it under a bushel or you are a city on a hill that's been placed there on purpose and then you've got to go into tomorrow when you go to work or you go to school or you go to whatever you go to, when you go on purpose, that's how you can be rescued from the ordinary life. That's how you live extraordinarily is going and knowing that the king has sent you on a mission. Look, I coach Little League Baseball and I don't feel like it's a waste of time because I have the perspective that I get to pour into these kids for this next baseball season. If it was about baseball, it would be a total waste of time. I mean, some of those kids got no hope. I tell them, you better be studying. I hope you're smart. Because it ain't baseball, dude. Right? We had a kid show up with a, a glove for each hand. 
You're gonna need to use those as oven mitts there, Pierre, all right? Cause that ain't, you got a chance. Cause quite honestly, I don't even like kids. I really don't. I like mine. I like my kids' friends pretty good. And then we got a couple of kids that can really hit well on my team, and I like them. The rest of them really get on my nerves. But here's what I know. I know that Tuesday we have practice, and Thursday we have practice, and then Saturday we have a game. And so for this baseball season, God has placed the little knuckleheads on my team that I can just love them and demonstrate the gospel and herald the good news of Jesus Christ to a bunch of seven- and eight-year-old little boys. And I was led to Christ by a coach that was more concerned about eternity than his football record. And so, now we're 4-0, and but still. <laughs> but it's about poor. So you see the difference? So I'm not saying, unless if Jesus tells you to quit your job, quit your job. Do something else. But I'm not saying everybody should. I'm saying when you go to work tomorrow, you go on purpose. You go on purpose. And I want this church to be the kind of place that rekindles that vision that you had at one point to do whatever it is for the glory of God and for the sake of his kingdom and so some people just need a, a change in perspective listen I don't 1 Corinthians 11 1 I read this very cautiously Paul says to the church in Corinth in 11 1 be imitators of me as I am of Christ now there's about 99 things that you should not imitate me on but in this one you should I am not wasting my life I am not wasting my life. God called me to do what I'm doing. And, you know, I had friends and family. I had lots of people going, are you being serious? And, and I just got off of the merry-go-round and have been walking in this faithful adventure that Christ has called me to. And so when people ask me the question, how are you doing? I either answer with better than I deserve because that's the gospel or I'm living the dream because it, it is a reality for me. And praise God, I had some people in my life that stoked and stirred God's vision for me to do this. And I want to do the same thing for this place. If you've got a vision, God put a vision or a dream in your life. The church is not the place where that thing comes to die. That, the church is the place where that thing comes to be resurrected and cultivated and nurtured so that you can be obedient to do what Christ has called you to do. And so, I was on the mission field this summer in Brazil. And we're building a church in Cano, literally our first church plant. You know, we're less than a year old. We're still planting that church. I think that's cool. We're planting this church, and we're planting it in the, in the voodoo capital of South America. And we're building the church in a place that has 100,000 people and less than a dozen evangelical churches. And from the, what I can figure out, less than a half a dozen gospel-centered churches for 100,000 people. And so we're planting a church there. And me and this guy, we're literally building the church. You know, we're... we're putting some like stucco on this concrete and he looks at me and he says how how many people get the opportunity to build a church I said, what are you talking about he goes yeah I mean think about this for generations and generations and generations this church it's literally it's outside of Cadeau it's up on this hill and it overlooks Cadeau he goes for generations people will look up on this hill and they will see a city on a hill and we got to be a part of building that church. And then the same guy, <clears throat> he began to talk about this church. And, and, and this guy, I mean, you want to talk about successful. He is like in a league of financial success that I don't even have a category for, okay? I, I still have some of the elders are trying to describe to me like where this guy has been. And, and you know, I just, I'm from Dillon. We don't have those categories, all right? And so... And then, but what, what's, what's happened is that God has stirred in this man to, to leverage that success for kingdom significance. And he began to talk about, and who gets the opportunity to build a church like the Church of 1122? I mean, and listen to me, folks. Do you want to be a part of a great adventure? Because some of you are thinking, okay, but I don't get to plant a church. What do I get to do tomorrow? i got to sell whatever I'm selling. If you were a part of this church, if you were a part of this church family, can you, I hope you understand that this isn't normal. That God is moving in this place. That, that pastors and elders pray and pray and pray for generations that God would move like this in their church. And for whatever reason, he's decided to move in here. And if you're here, then you get to be a part of it. You get to be a part of it. Don't waste your life just chasing after the shiny things of this world. 
But how about join me in investing in the things that are eternal? You want to be a part of something amazing? Open up your notes to the middle. The top of the middle, right there where it says action steps. Be a part of creating an environment for every generation that brings life and fuels dreams and awakens souls. And the way you can do that is you can commit to the Restore Project. Pastor Jeremy said it earlier. This isn't the field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. I mean, look around, folks. They're here. So we need to build it. And so if you, if you see that arrow with the muzzy broad head on the end pointing towards that way, there's 25,000 square feet back there that were, that were it, construction started months ago. You can walk through there. There's a big window. You can look through and see the walls coming up. And you know why we need to do it? You know why we need to do it? Here's why. On the other side of that wall right now are our children. I got two in there. Our children are over there. And, and here's the thing. It, it happens every week that we have to turn families away because we don't have enough room. I mean, look around here, right? We're, we're packed out. We need more room. Here, here's the thing about, about our children. Is that our children still believe, because they, they hadn't been in the world long enough to hear all the people and the voices tear them down and tell them they're not good enough and they can't do it and why don't you just be average and hop on the merry-go-round. So our kids right now, when they hear from their disciple group leaders stories from the Bible like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these three young men who King Nebuchadnezzar said, bow down to my idol or I'm throwing you in the fiery furnace. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if they said, they said, listen, you can throw us in the fire or, or leave us out here, but we're not bowing down to your idol. And we, we know God can save us, and we believe he will. And even if he doesn't, we're not bowing down to your idol. And when our kids hear that over there, they think, well, why not me? If, the, if God could use those three dudes, he could use me. Or when they hear about David and Goliath, that, that God used the smallest of all the sons, that was just delivering pizza to his brothers out there to check on him, and then God used him to slay the giant. You know what our kids think? Our kids think, well, why not me? You see, they haven't bought into the, the ordinary lie that this world sells us. And these students right here, listen, there are some of you that God is moving in your life. And if you will be obedient to God's call in your life, you have no idea what hangs in the balance. You have no idea the hundreds or thousands of eternities that hang in the balance. Because I can tell you, when I was, when I was sitting there, I would have been least likely chosen to lead a church. I promise. I was the one struggling to get to stay at the retreat the whole weekend, okay? And yet God called me and God moved in me. And part of what we're doing back here too, I don't know if you know this, our students have outgrown their worship space, so now they are in here on Wednesday nights. And so in, our, uh, in the Restore Project, there's a 500-seat worship auditorium that our students will be able to use on Wednesday night. Amen? Wow. Amen. So here's the thing, open it up. Again, if you open it up, you see the action step is this, that I, I want you to, you want to be a part of something epic? Commit to the Restore Project. We, we talked about it over the summer, and we said it was going to be a six-month campaign, and then we haven't talked about it for a little while, and it's kind of like Eutychus, right? It fell asleep and died, and we've got to resuscitate it, and here we are. So there's a few things. We've extended it from a six-month to an 18-month project. So even if you filled out a commitment card before, we're, we're you know, tripling the time of, uh, that we're going to receive receive money on this. We need to raise about two and a half million dollars, and we need you to pray like crazy and just be obedient to whatever God calls you to give to this Restore Project. Also, uh, earlier in the summer, we said that the, upon this rock givers that we don't need you. Well, we do. We need you to get involved, so we need you to prayerfully consider giving to the Restore Project. And if you'll, if you'll look at the middle there, there's a picture. See that little girl with the pickaxe? Now, we're not so broke that we're into child labor now. I mean, that's not what we're doing. We didn't go to them and be like, third graders, you build your own place, all right? Here's a hard hat. <clears throat> that, that, uh, that little girl, her name's Jade Long. And uh, Jade is nine years old today. And Jade's mom and dad are Cliff and Selena Long. And here, here's what's cool about making disciples in Jacksonville for 10 years, and I hope to do it for the rest of my life that uh, Cliff and Selena were our first friends in Jacksonville. When we, when we, Gretchen and I moved here 10 years ago to be the youth pastor at Beach, 
and I walked into the first youth group event, and uh, I fussed at Cliff and Selena and said, kids, y'all get in your group, and they said, actually, we're adult leaders, and so uh, <laughs> they're about 10 years younger than us, and so we became friends, and we, um, we started a Bible study together. This is before there was even like small group ministries and stuff like that at the church, but I knew that we needed some friends to study the Bible with, and so we would meet on Thursday nights and watch friends, and then we would study the Bible. Not my idea. And so uh, nine years ago today, Cliff and Selena gave birth to the first kid in the small group. And so we were at the hospital when Jade was born. And I think I was probably the first non-medical staff or family to hold Jade in this world. I held her when she was probably, you know, 20 minutes old or something. And, and, I, and I think she was the first baby I'd ever held. Because I wasn't really into it. You know, I didn't really care to. And fellas, you'll know what I'm talking about. Remember when you held that first one? She only weighed like seven pounds or something. I'd pick up seven pounds, but I just didn't know how to do it. And so I, you just kind of make the cradle, and you're like, all right, put her in. And Gretchen kind of, you know, or somebody put her in there, and then you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm cramping. Get her. Get her. Take her back. Take her back. Okay, I did it. I did it. I'm out. <laughs> By the time you have your own kid, you know, the last ones, you're just like, here, take this one. You toss them to each other in the car. <clears throat> So, at the end of every Bible study we have, we go friends, Bible study, and then we do some prayer time. And at, at the end of every single one of those, Cliff, 10 years ago, used to sell cell phones and do really well. He would always win, like, the trips and be the number one salesperson. And he was, you know, he was, they were fast-tracking him to middle management in cell phone land. And yet, there was this holy discontent stirring within him. And at the end of every Bible study, he'd say, can you guys just pray about, like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life, and I just need direction, and it can't be this. This is just not for me. And now, um, Cliff is the tech director for the Church of 1122 here. He runs all the things that plug in and all of that. <clears throat> and, and Selena works in the finance department. Right? The staff love her. She fills out the paychecks all the time, you know, so we love her. She, they both, they work here. They serve here. And do you know what God has in store for Jade? You have no idea. And I have no idea. And I have no idea what hangs in the balance for this nine-year-old little girl. But can I tell you what I want to do, what I want to be faithful when I stand before God Almighty, and give an account for this church, I want to be able to faithfully say, and I want you to be able to join me and faithfully say, we created an environment for every generation, every man, woman, student, and child, that when they came to the church of 1122, first and foremost, they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that as the Holy Spirit softened hearts and penetrated hearts and broke down barriers and drew men and women and students and children unto himself, that it was always an environment where we cultivated dreams and visions. That this place was like a dream center. That students and children and families would come into this place and actually hear from the Holy Spirit. That Almighty God, the Great Shepherd, would speak to His sheep and we would recognize His voice. And that it would not be a church of no, but it would be a church of yes and prepare and go. And that's what we would do right here each and every week. And I need your help. I need your help. You want to do something significant? You want to be rescued from an ordinary life? You want to get off the merry-go-round of normality and step into this great adventure with audacious faith? And I need you to, I, we got to get all in on this Restore project to continue to cultivate environments for students like this and children that are other, on the other side of this wall, our very own kids, that they, that they could walk in the audacious audacious things that Christ calls them into. So I need your help. If you would please stand and pray with me. Father in heaven, God, we love you. We praise you. God, we thank you. God, we thank you that you are the giver of dreams. Lord, I pray. I pray for the students. I pray for the, the new gen kids in this place. That Lord, as one day when they are sharing their testimony, to give glory to you about all the great things that you have done in their lives. And when people say, how did you do it, God? That a part of their story would be the church they grew up in. 
that they could say, I went to a church that preached the gospel and actually believed that God had called me to do something significant. And God, I pray, I pray for the men and women in this place whose dreams have gone to sleep and whose visions have died by the power of the Holy Spirit, God, today. Just like Paul resurrected Eutychus, God, would you resurrect some visions and dreams in this place today? And God, would you stir in us by the power of the Holy Spirit, God, would you give us power to do whatever it is that you have called us to do? We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, every week we respond to the gospel. One of the ways that you can respond this week is in the back of your bulletin. You could fill out your Restore Project commitment. You could tear it off and you could bring it down. You could bring it down front. Or there's Restore banners all over the, all over the worship center and there are boxes next to it. You could drop it in there. You could drop it in there. You could drop it in on the way out. There's even some out in the lobby. If you're a regular here at the Church of 1122, then you can bring your tithes and offerings to the giving boxes around here, or the giving kiosk back there. A bunch of you need to come to the altar and say, God, would you resurrect that dream and that vision that you put in me a long time ago that I have let fall asleep? And then all of us, the way that we respond is we'll join our voices together to glorify his name. Let us respond.